Thank you very much, Derek, for that uh, most interesting and uh, in many ways provocative presentation. So um, over to you. There are some roving microphones around. First question to Dr Yak. Um, everything you said was an admission of guilt, that you recognise that you are selling an unhealthy product because you were saying we've got to reduce the advertising. That that what you're selling and trying to advertise is bad news. If you were serious about this, you'd cut marketing for, for, for Pepsi, for, for all soft drinks, for all high sugar, high fat foods, and just market Pepsi for cleaning boat decks. So I have to try to somehow repeat that. <laughs> I might actually ask Derek to do that. Um, but I guess that the crux of the question is that if you accept that the company produces food and, and, and products which contribute directly to obesity, um, do you not have some obligation to you know, withdraw the promotion of those products entirely? Is that a nice way of putting it? Oh, indeed, the production. Yeah, and I think uh, you know, I've got these two uh, mics here. Um, I, obviously, I, I respect your right to to choose however, whatever you tend to consume. I, I remember um, when I was um, a, a lifeguard on Clifton Beach, which is slightly more beautiful than Bondi Beach down in Cape Town, which is up there in the corner. At the beginning of the season, um, the big Coke van, even though I'm working for Pepsi, it's Coke land in South Africa, the Coke van used to arrive, and this is the mid-70s, and we used to get a, um, our supply of Cokes for the season. Um, and what was interesting was this was an era when um, obesity levels were neither discussed nor increasing. Um, the consumption of the product was in accordance with the, the heat and the refreshment needs of people of the day. And I think what happened over the course of the decades is not that the product itself has anything wrong with it, um, and you, know, you might want to dispute that, but that the quantity of consumption in some people increased. Uh, one of Rosemary's suggestions was the traffic light system, uh, the gist of which I think she can correct me if I'm wrong, was better education of the consumers about what they're eating. Uh, how would you respond to that suggestion? Uh, do you think the big company, food companies are, are doing that well enough or should be doing it better or is that not an area that they should be worrying about? I think we agree with the need to better inform consumers. Um, and depending on different markets, we think we need to do better with, I mentioned the point of calorie transparency. This is uh, an obesity debate. I think we need to do everything we can to let people truly understand what is a calorie, how much there are in products, um, and how we do that in a quantitative way is something we, we're pursuing and looking forward to, to addressing. I think our sense is that it's better to give um, higher quality quantitative data rather than put something into categories which are often more complex for people to interpret. And that's based upon some of the surveys across Europe where we first look at, uh, and the surveys looking at traffic lights versus a wide range of other uh, issues which we, you can read about in literature. The bottom line seems to be that maybe 15% at most of consumers are actually responding to any of the signals on the front of pack. And the biggest response actually comes from food companies between themselves reformulating in response to some of the labels to get the numbers down or to make some of the changes. So principle, yes, we accept of, of uh, important labeling. We don't yet know there's one universal solution that's going to do the trick. And I think it, we should experiment. We do actually have some, some data which was put forward on traffic light labels by some of the people who, I don't know if they're still in the audience, but we're in the audience, where they found that simply classifying things with a colour that people could see quickly, you can't sort of read the labels on 1800 snack foods in the supermarket and look at the back. And if it tells you it contains 14% of one thing and 6.3% of something or other else and 2.7% of something, it's, it's, it's fairly meaningless. Having a red light on foods has actually turned people off the product. We also have a problem in Australia, uh, Derek, that we use kilojoules, not calories, and that is a huge problem, and I really do think we need a very simple energy um, definition because people cannot add up 417.6 kilojoules in one product, 283 in another, and I've, probably very few have added even those two, and they don't know what it means. So we certainly need a symbol that signifies the product has a high, medium or low 
um, energy content. And I think that the, the colouring system is certainly one that does that, whereas endless numbers are not able to be accessed very well by people who have less a lower educational level. Now, there are two people who've got their hand up and I, at the back, and I fear that they, they're going to be reducing the blood supply to their fingers if I don't put them out of their misery soon. So last two questions, the gentleman in the brown and then the, the, the lady in the, in the black. This is a question for Dr Yak. He mentioned that 5% um, of calorie intake in the United States and the United Kingdom and presumably Australia is attributable to soft drinks. And then you showed that it's very hard to change that with marketing. You know, you make a little bit of a difference by modifying your market a little bit. But I see, you know, 5% from soft drinks, we can just, what's wrong with a regulatory ban on adding sugar to packaged beverages? Well, we have no clue what that would do. There's uh, no question that people would um, use their money to purchase other foods, and we don't know whether they would uh, choose to uh, select foods at even higher levels of fat, sugar, and calories uh, if we did that. I don't see that going after one particular category in the system is going to make the impact that you would desire. And that's the point of actually saying we need to be thinking about the kind of approach we're doing for sodium, for example, which is to acknowledge that there are 18 or 20 food groups. We need to be thinking about an incremental, long-term, volatile strategy to reduce the level of sodium across all, all product lines. And that's likely to both be supportive by industry over the long run and in the end, that's going to be a far better way of ensuring that we get to where we want, which is a low sodium yield in the population, than, say, to choosing a particular food group or category and going to either take them out of the market. So last, last question for this evening. Um, so this is kind of a double-stranded question for both Rosemary and Derek, um, addressing the... Um, figures that Rosemary mentioned that were coming out about the carbon and water tax or carbon and water footprints of various foods. Um, so firstly to Rosemary, um, what exactly, which body is doing that research and how can I find more, find out more information about that? And secondly to Derek, how do you think the food industry would respond to that kind of tax? My, uh, the first question was about uh, carbon and water footprint. Certainly the carbon footprint is being looked at by a number of people. Uh, commercially, Planet Arc is working with some people from CSIRO and a number of um, other, including food companies, looking at carbon footprint of foods in Australia. At this university, the Department of Physics has been very interested in that. The Weight Institute in, uh, in South Australia has also been looking at that. Uh, there are a number of people who are looking at it, probably going to be con uh, sort of put together by somebody like the Australian uh, Conservation Foundation, um, but certainly Planet Arc is aiming to have labels on particular products by mid next year, certainly for the carbon footprint. The water footprint is something that is unique to us, well, it's not unique to Australia, but it's certainly very important to Australia, and I think we certainly need some work. I've been trying to find some um, funds for that to occur so that we get some good figures for Australia. I certainly think it's the way we need to go in the future. It also, for those of us who work in health, when we start looking at some of the data that's already available, and much of it is for the US, so it's not necessarily applicable here, but when we start looking at the uh, sustainability index that we could give to particular foods, you happen to come up with a diet which is pretty well exactly what I've been trying to get people to eat for the last 40-something years. Um, and I can do it without mentioning health um, at all, simply because if, if people are looking at another aspect of food, what is the sustainability, the carbon cost, the water cost of producing this food, it's something we can teach kids in school and they can choose their foods on that basis without having to feel punished that they're not allowed to have um, the cheesels or whatever. Um, so I think that this would give us the right result without us having to keep harping on about health. Derek, do you want to comment? Yeah, I, I think um, you know, my response to simply jumping into the tax question would be to say that's, uh, again, a pretty blunt instrument to try and achieve a very complex set of goals. Um, I'd hope tomorrow night to go into a little bit more about what are we really trying to do in terms of separately, and then there's some combination between water use, um, which is obviously a separate issue from the broad issues of our carbon footprint, 
and how both of them are taken very seriously. Um, if, again, if you go to um, our website at pepsico.com and look under the environmental sustainability issue, you'll find um, some information. If you want more, just let me know. But um, there's, uh, the first thing before you can start doing it is to get the metrics right. And that's, we're now in a position to actually say, well, what is the size of our carbon footprint in the UK, for example? And then start looking at the supply chain and start critically saying, well, where are the opportunities to bring it down? What's holding us up making progress? The same with water. Um, one assumes that we've got all the data at hand immediately. Well, we don't. And often there's surprising shifts. For us as a company, some of the biggest shifts in water consumption come out of um, some of the changes in the way we are growing rice in India and in the paddy fields where through different forms of technology we've reduced by 40% the demand of uh, water use uh, in some of the Indian paddy fields. The same would be true in some of the potato plants across the world where instead of um, being a net large consumer of water, we're starting, our vision is to become a, a contributor to the environment of water given that potatoes are basically stuffed with water and uh, they could be returned to the environment. So people are surprised often when they hear the, the detailed discussion going on and some of the technology that's out there to both promote more efficient water use um, and uh, as well as some of the carbon footprint issues. But I hope to go into more detail tomorrow. Okay, well, please join me in thanking both the speakers.